Earmax Highlights. And here's your host, Anne O'Donnell. Welcome to the Earmax Highlights, where we put together the best stories of the week for you. Let's have a look at our top three. Beer Bash checking out the fashions at the Munich Oktoberfest. Tourist magnet why Nice is a top vacation resort in southern France. And Community Spirit investigating the growing trend of sharing. Well, the International Motor Show is currently underway in Frankfurt. Car lovers come to look at the technology, but also the interior design is just as important. The car designers are very much influenced by fashion trends, so they attend all the world's leading runway shows. Euromax investigates. The latest car trends are hitting the runways, just like models at a fashion show. But are the colors, shapes, and materials used in automotive design today the same ones that are appearing on the catwalks and in clothing stores? You definitely won't see the cuts of clothes seen on the catwalk this season reflected in a car silhouette. But in the interior design, there's a big connection to fashion design, especially the design of accessories. Italian designer Simona Falcinella is head of color and trim at Audi. She's responsible for the look of the car's surfaces, both inside and out. Falcinella follows everything going on in the fashion world. She attends all the fashion weeks in Paris, Milan, London, and New York, but what works for people doesn't always work for cars. It's very easy to buy uh, the pink uh, T-shirt with, uh, I don't know, big flowers, no? You use it one, two, three times, maybe just once, and then throw it away. The car is, is a big thing, no? And, uh, and uh, is lower. But maybe that pink T-shirt will allow us just to put a little pink tendance on the beige, for example. For example, Gotland Green and Matador Red, current colors used for the Audi A4, can also be found in the fashion world. Simona has created mood boards using samples she's collected from past seasons. Here we have a, a new red and um, it's very deep, it's very, very elegant. It's slightly brown, like, like we see the movement, the movement is going. And as, uh, as you can see, the, the inspiration is coming from different world of design and uh, is inspiration at the same, at the same time is a um, confirmation that this is the right direction to go. It's easier to spot the influence of fashion on a vehicle's interior than on its exterior. When it comes to color and materials, men's fashion plays the biggest role, not because men's wear is generally more conservative, but because men are often the target group. There is a lot, of, mainly in the main men fashion, combination of warm and cold. No? So you have to, as you see here, desaturate very much the colors and then combine this warm beige, for example, with the cold dark gray. No? And we played a lot with a very small detail in the crafting, so the piping and then the stitching in contrast. And uh, a detail that uh, I love actually is this uh, Oh, but the treatment is open poor and you have a sound feeling. Luxury cars are to the automotive industry what haute couture is to the fashion industry. And series production models are like the ready-to-wear collections. Yet compact cars are the most reflective of fashion trends. You'll likely find more young buyers in the lower price segment, so much more experimentation goes on there, with gadgets, different color combinations and different materials. And more fabric is used in this price segment, which is more easily varied as far as color and shape is concerned. While Audi is presenting its latest vision of future mobility at the Frankfurt Motor Show, Simona is busy collecting new sources of inspiration to be used in cars in years to come. It's not enough just to have 
this surface and then the reflection with the color, for example, but we want something more. What I, I appreciate very much at the moment is not just uh, this plastic 3D, but even the 2D that gives you the effect of the, mom of, of the movement. So it's super interesting. And I think it's something that we can use too. But ultimately, it's the more long-lived trends that wind up being reflected in car design rather than the flashy fads. After all, most people plan to drive their cars for more than just one season. Well, the Munich Oktoberfest is just around the corner. Millions will descend on the Bavarian capital for the biggest beer festival in the world. Fashions at the event, though, are a changing. And this year, too much skin is definitely not in. Euromax has the scoop. Munich based fashion designer Anja Württemberger has been making dirndls for seven years. Creations cost between 400 and 1600 euros. There are 26 dundles in her current collection. Bertenberger has a pretty good idea what will be on show at this year's Oktoberfest. I think the trends for a while now have been toward more traditional styles, more muted colors, less garish fabrics, fewer patterns, or more traditional patterns. The really colorful and glittery period is over. I have the feeling that people now are returning to the things that make their homeland home for them, or to the things that they connect with their homeland. That means less detail work and fewer patterns. This year, most designers are striving for elegant simplicity. Rasha Fajari has come to buy her very first dirndl. I picked something out that I think will look great on you. I think these colors go really well together. Yes, I love green and red. That's a start. <laughs> I think this cut will also look great on you. This has a traditional Munich neckline. Mm -hmm. And with this one, you can wear the collar down or up. The stand-up collar is back in style, making for a less revealing neckline. That's a retreat from the styles of the last few years when it seemed that anything was allowed. Glaring colors, ostentatious embroidery, ruffles and ribbons. As much detail work and embellishment as possible. And materials were also eye-catching. Even African patterns were in for a while. The wilder, the better. I think those styles were too extreme. In the last few years, they were outrageous and gaudy. If you held a match to some of them, poof, they'd go up like that. Really extreme. It hit a peak, but now things are going back to normal. Ethnologist Simona Ega has discovered that the dirndl isn't as old as one might think. Its roots date back to country maids, dern in Bavarian. But the outfit worn so proudly today only began to grow popular in the 19th century, when fashionable city ladies began to take country holidays. The rich families that could afford to would leave the city for several weeks in the summer. And an inventive tailor somewhere must have taken the basic work clothes design from dresses worn by milkmaids and country girls added a plaid or some flower designs and turned it into a vacation outfit for the wealthy visitors. And there's another big difference between dirndls and traditional dress. Traditional clothing reveals details about where you come from and your social status. Many traditional societies, especially in Austria and Bavaria, still pay attention to such old-fashioned customs. The dirndl, on the other hand, has changed dramatically, but also remained faithful to its roots. The dirndl is basically an interpretation of the historic traditional costume. What's remained is the silhouette of the woman who wears it. You have the wide skirt, the emphasis on the waist, and then the bodice top. Back at the store, Raja Fajari's dirndl gets the final touches. The apron completes the dirndl. You look beautiful, just like Snow White. 
I think I found a really great dirndl, one without a lot of frills. I like the classic look and pretty colors. They suit me, and I think I look very smart. But no matter which dirndl you choose, there's one thing you should never forget. In Bavaria, the bow is a way to send a message. If you tie it on the right, you're taken. On the left, you're not. In the middle means you can't decide. Widows and waitresses wear them in back. People pay attention to that here. It's important. The dundel is a timeless classic, one that's meant to be comfortable. That's when it looks best of all. But our next report takes us to the French city of Nice, as well as its famous promenade. It also features a quaint old town and some fantastic places to shop and eat as well. Nice attracts over 3.5 million visitors every year from all around the world. Let's see why. Nice is a jewel on the French Riviera. Holidaymakers flock to the city renowned for its mild Mediterranean climate. The Promenade des Anglais is a landmark in Nice. The seven kilometer long walkway is named after British tourists who proposed and financed its construction in the 19th century. Imposing buildings line the route. The Promenade des Anglais is very important to Nice. It became a glamorous place in the 19th century. The place where grand hotels were built and rich visitors came for spa holidays. The walkway became Nice's showcase, and an entire district grew up around it. The promenade made Nice famous, sparking a trend now known around the globe as tourism. This stretch of coastline was just a pebbly beach until wealthy British vacationers financed the construction of the promenade. Opened in 1824, it made Nice a tourist destination. Luxury Hotel Negresco is the most famous building along the promenade. Built in the style of the Belle Epoque, it opened its doors in 1912. The Cour Salaya market in the Old Town is an institution in Nice. Held daily, it's the city's oldest market. Vendors have been selling their wares here for over 150 years. The market is also famous for its colorful flowers, which inspired artists like Henri Matisse and Marc Chagall. Journalist Petra Hall has been coming here for many years. Here at the Kursaleya market, many things come together. Wonderful scents, aromas, colors. Mixed together, they create a Mediterranean flair that the artists found irresistible. Here they also found the motifs they needed for their artwork. Marc Chagall painted many pictures of Nice. They can be seen at the National Museum, which bears the artist's name. Over 400 of his works are on display here, making it the world's largest Chagall collection open to the public. Marc Chagall discovered the Côte d'Azur in 1926. He was dazzled by all the flowers at the market. He returned after the Second World War, after living in exile in America. He lived here from 1948 until his death in 1985. He was inspired by the region's light and the colors. Nice's old town dates back more than 2,000 years. Its winding alleyways and pastel-colored buildings resemble those of Italian towns. And no wonder, until it was annexed by France over a century and a half ago, Nice still belonged to the Kingdom of Sardinia. Since 1860, Nice, the county of Nice, because it's the whole region from here to Monton, has belonged to France. But Italian culture, Italian cuisine, and the Italian dialect have been retained here. And you can sense that everywhere. Nice's port district has recently become hip. New parks have been created, like this one near Place Massina, Nice's main square. Young entrepreneurs have also moved in and opened up trendy boutiques and restaurants. Like Contois Central Electrique. Two years ago, it was still an electronics store until German chef Ralf Nuss transformed it into Nice's hottest bistro. 
The district is drawing more and more young people. Increasingly, restaurants, bars and designer stores are opening up here. A lot of really creative people come here and go out for the evening. The nicest view over the city can be had from the Collin du Chateau. The 92-meter-high hilltop park lies between the old town and the port. For Ralf Nuss, it's the nicest place in Nice. The best thing is the view. Here, Nice lies at your feet at any time of the day, and at night, too, when you come here, everything's lit up. It's just stunning. The Colline du Chateau doesn't just boast the best view over Nice. It's also the place where this jewel of the French Riviera was once founded. Flat sharing, car sharing and office sharing, they're all part of a global trend which is proving very popular here in Germany. Well, it's not just about getting more bang for your book. According to a recent study, people are searching for a real sense of community while rejecting pointless consumerism. We had a look at the different ways they go about it. Our society is changing. We meet strangers for a dinner arranged online. We trade clothes with people we don't know. After years of working to accumulate personal possessions, many people now want to see things put to use effectively. Sharing and a community spirit play a central role at the Forever Now Festival in Berlin. First, it was the me generation. This is the we generation. I'm new in Berlin, and I've been actively searching for other people to connect with. I want to help create new cultural structures and meeting places. It's great when people change and become more human and integrate more we into their own lives. German trend researcher Kirsten Brühl knows this longing for togetherness is more than a short-lived fad. She published the results of her research for the Future Institute in Frankfurt and put out a study on the topic. One factor driving this change is technology. It's never been as easy to band together and make contact with one another as it is now. Another aspect is that now the world is demanding that we join together so we can better deal with certain issues, to move ahead with innovations in a company, for instance. But in our private lives, too, we need new forms of organization. The complexity of the world we live in demands that we find other organizational forms. One manifestation of this new culture of togetherness and sharing has already been reshaping our society and economy for years, the sharing economy. Car sharing, for example, where several people share one car, has become commonplace in major cities. Flat sharing is changing the way we travel. Websites such as Airbnb help us find an affordable room in private homes, and they're providing competition for hotels. There are forms of we where I must only invest a bit of myself and which have a smaller degree of communal feeling. We've decided to call them the efficiency we's. Many phenomena come together here that we know from the sharing economy. These are very efficient offers where it's all about optimizing our personal lifestyles by using things belonging to others. These developments are shaping our working lives. Berlin's Beta House offers co-working spaces. Since 2009, it's rented out flexible workspaces and even offers legal and financial advice. Those who work here are freelancers, but they're still part of an office community. This blend of efficiency and community has caught on. Now, three more Beta Houses have opened in cities around Europe. When we first started, most of the people who came here were looking for a flexible and cheap workplace for a short period of time. Now our members come here looking for access to a community, to experts and co-founders and so on, technicians and social contacts as well. At this urban garden in central Berlin, it's also all about social contacts. Since 2009, the community has grown and harvested the produce. Robert Shaw founded the nonprofit project and sees it as a place of exchange, based on common values and personal relationships. 
Many people who come here no longer want to be part of the consumption chain. I go from my apartment to my workplace, to a restaurant during my break, back to my workplace and then home again. And on the way, I stop at the supermarket to buy something or other. So my main activity is to go from A to B and buy something in a public place. And what we offer here is an active way to participate, to take part in this place. What happens is that people communicate with each other here. So we basically facilitate communication in a public space. These days we're expressing our desire for humanity and social experiences. Right now, Germany is welcoming people in their thousands, people we didn't expect. So where's the hitch in this new we mentality? I believe that in the future we'll have to deal intensively with the topic of belonging or not belonging. Developing criteria about whether we are allowed to belong to this society or another, because it encapsulates a great danger that certain groups of people who present their views quietly rather than loudly, who tend not to market themselves aggressively, won't be noticed. These various communities exist for a number of reasons, from ways to make life more efficient to forging personal relationships. The new feelings of community are changing our world. To make sure the development is positive, the individual is in demand more than ever. Now you'd think a German might know which beer goes best with what bread, but apparently the world's best beer sommelier comes from Italy. It's the first time an Italian picked up that title. He doesn't think it's so surprising himself though, with a fast growing beer culture in Italy. Eight taps. Eight different beers. Simon Mattia Riva has invited people in for a beer tasting in his beer garage in Bergamo, Italy. He sees himself as an ambassador for beer. A trained expert in taste, color, and consistency, he is the world's champion beer sommelier. You can start from a fresh, uh, uh, light uh, Pilsner and then they arrive to you a, a, a Belgian Trappist or, or a, a barley wine with a rich flavor of uh, figs, uh, chocolate, dark fruit. This widespread of, uh, of flavor and aromas is, the, I think, the most fascinating thing in uh, beer. Riva and his wife Francesca aren't surprised that an Italian beer champion should come from Bergamo. The city at the foot of the Alps is famous for its culinary traditions. Riva's appetite for beer started when he was 18, but he only recently resigned from his job as a teacher to make beer his profession. A lot is happening with beer in Italy. Now we have uh, uh, much uh, craft breweries, uh, more than 800 of, uh, of craft breweries, and so people can uh, choose, choose very different beer, uh, not only the the ancient, the traditional, uh, standard uh, industrial lager. For many people, that makes it hard to maintain an overview. That's why Riva works as a beer sommelier in a restaurant on the outskirts of Bergamo. Here, he decides which beer goes with a diner's order. Riva began his beer studies at specialized Italian schools, then continued at a beer academy in Bavaria. Today, he really knows his way around taste and smell, production and distribution. His wife works as the creative advisor in the brewery Hop Skin in Bergamo. Hops, yeast, malt make up the mixture for beer. The master brewer shows off his newest creation, beer with a chocolate flavor. There are 6,000 different kinds of beer in Italy, and the number is growing. The market for fine beers is booming all over the world, so Riva's professional prospects look good. People in Bergamo are proud of their world champion. 
Riva's friends have decorated the entrance to his beer garage with posters and goodwill messages. Whatever he gives me, the first beer, the second, the third, it always tastes good. There's a beer for every situation, for every time of the day, for every taste. Beer is fascinating. The community of beer lovers is definitely growing in Italy. But there's no reason to worry about the country's wine tradition. There's room on the palate for both. That brings us to the end of today's show. Thanks for us for watching in Berlin. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.